Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know a bit more about tonight's author, Jordan Group. Jordan Group is also on YouTube and does narrations of his own work, besides just the narrations that you see here. If you want to find Jordan Group Horror, take a look in the description down below. I have a link over to his YouTube channel, as well as that little eye in the top corner there will also take you over to Jordan Group Horror. Or you can just go over to youtube.com slash at Jordan Group, or, you know, you could probably just search Jordan Group inside of your... YouTube search bar. But wait, before you go and do that, on with tonight's story. The job of a Yosemite park ranger isn't what most people imagine. I mean, a lot of people picture us as law enforcement type, you know, handing out tickets, enforcing park rules. Really, that's a very niche aspect of it. Mostly, we're just here to assist you in handing out maps, not speeding tickets and giving people directions to the best views to ideal camping locations. We remind people about safety and weather conditions from day to day, but the main thing we do, and this is more vital than people realize, is that we're just here in case anyone gets lost or gets hurt. We deal with a lot of belligerent people who like to think the park is their personal playground where they can do whatever they want. I mean, it's my job to remind them to follow the rules, to dispose of their trash properly, to pick up after their dog, and to clip its leash back on while walking the trails. Some people take this as a personal assault on their freedoms, when really I'm just looking out for the safety of other visitors, you know, like cyclists, horseback riders who share the path. Dogs can be unpredictable and can misbehave on trails. And we have to look out for everyone, you know? Still, I don't often get a lot of positive feedback for enforcing the rules. And, I mean, nobody likes to be told what to do. Trust me, I get it. Every once in a while, something interesting happens to break up the boredom and monotony of the job. Every summer, I was walking around at night, doing a patrol of the campgrounds, when I saw something rustling around in the bushes. A guy came crawling out dressed in a, uh, you know, one of those furry dog costumes. I asked him if he was okay, he just barked happily, then he just he crawled back in the opposite direction. Shortly afterwards, I saw him chasing another person who was dressed as a cat, a woman who went scampering away and hid underneath a camper van, laughing excitedly uh, and making purring sounds, looking at the dirt from her fur pants with this long tongue. She saw me watching, clawed the air in front of her face, hissing territorially. I mean, it's, uh, I, uh, that, that's, that's not, um, <laughs> it's not how I choose to spend my Friday nights, but I'm not one to judge. By far, the most interesting thing that's ever happened to me at Yosemite occurred last summer. And it wasn't just interesting. It, it was utterly terrifying. Every night when I fall asleep, I have nightmares about that day. Every time I close my eyes, I, I picture those dark tunnels in the rock face. It's not how I choose to... Sp I it all started when someone called in a report saying that they were out on the Cathedral Lake Trail and their brother went missing. The pair had been out hiking when they got separated somehow. At first, we thought it was just a routine mishap. I mean, people go missing in Yosemite all the time. It's no big deal in most cases. Since usually the missing parties are found quickly enough, half the time alcohol is involved and I have to remind people to pace themselves if they indulge while camping. But every once in a while, those missing people don't turn up. We have to dispatch a much larger search party. In this case, I went out on my own at first, heading to where the man had called us from. I drove out on an ATV since it was a 16-mile round trip. When I got there, the guy looked frantic. He ran over to me and started speaking way too fast to understand. I told him to slow down and just give me the facts. It's important to stay calm in these types of situations. The guy took a deep breath and let it out. And he started talking again a bit slower this time. We were walking on the trail. He was right beside me. And then I, I, I turned around to look at the lake. And when I looked back, he was gone. Just, just fucking gone. I tried to get a sense if the man had been drinking or doing drugs. It's not that I'm trying to assume the worst in people, but we have to think of these types of things. The simplest explanation is usually the right one, after all. It was much easier to imagine the two brothers taking sips from a Mickey and one of them getting separated and lost than to imagine one of them being abducted by aliens or taken in a very selective rapture. 
slow down for a second. Okay, uh, take some deep breaths. What's your name? Let's start with that. Greg, he said, his face turning a shade less purple as he began to inhale air while trembling breaths in and out. Okay, Greg. I took out my notepad, jotting this down along with his last name, which I'll leave out for the sake of privacy. And hey, what's your brother's name? Dave, he said, sniffling. I saw you've been crying recently. Okay, where was the last place you saw your brother? Let's retrace your steps. He started protesting, saying that it wasn't going to help, but I convinced him we had to at least try. Greg led me back a little ways to where he'd seen his brother last. I walked back here already. I looked all around before calling you guys. I thought maybe he went off the trail to take a leak and he tripped and he hit his head. You know, something like that. I, I don't know. I was grasping at straws, but I think something... He hesitated. Something what? I probed. Do you, do you think something took him? You know, like those stories you hear about. He sounded embarrassed, but I tried to get more out of him and asked him which stories he was talking about. Do you know the stories about Yosemite and other national parks? I'm sure you've heard about them. Even if you're not in on the conspiracy stories, you know, where people go missing like that and it makes no sense. Someone turns their back for a second and then their, their son or their sister or whoever is just gone, you know, disappeared. Like Dave. I saw it on YouTube. Uh-huh. I replied, not sure what corner of the internet this guy had been visiting. Well, that doesn't happen around here, I can assure you. Let's, um, let's keep looking. I'm sure it'll turn up. But the longer we looked, the less we found. I mean, it really did seem like the man's brother had just up and vanished. I was about to call in for more support, maybe even a canine unit, when the man yelled from a little ways off the trail, saying he'd found something. Following the sound of his voice, I eventually came to him at the base of the mountain, face to face with this granite wall. At first, I didn't understand what he was doing there, but as I got closer, I saw there was actually a cave which was well hidden in the rock face. It blended in perfectly with the mountainside until you were almost nose to nose with the pale gray stone. Oh, good job, I said, patting him on the shoulder. But then I looked at our surroundings, getting nervous. We were pretty far from the path, and the thick part of the forest, which was overgrown and tangled with vines and shrubbery. Do you think he would have gone into the cave on his own? Greg looked around, as if checking to see if his brother had left a message for him, but there was nothing. I don't think so. It's not like him to just leave me on the trail alone, either, especially not for this long... If this was a prank or something, he'd have to come back by now, I... I can tell something's not right. Has your brother played pranks on you like this before? I asked. The man was in his twenties. And his brother was probably of a similar age. Young men occasionally get lost or injured trying to scare each other by pulling pranks or filming videos in the woods. It was rare, but it had happened before. Once or twice, he admitted. I didn't call you guys for a while because I thought he was messing with me, you know? I... I wouldn't put it past him, but not for this long. I was getting annoyed. Mosquitoes were biting my neck, and I was sweating in the heat of the afternoon after marching through the foliage for hours. I imagined the guy hiding inside the cave trying to scare his younger brother. Maybe he had fallen asleep in his dark hiding place, or he was pushing it too far. But either way, I was upset. If this was a prank, it had wasted most of my afternoon probably annoyed me even more because I had my own older brother who had played tricks on me more than once in my younger days. And this was bringing back memories. All right, you can come out of there right now, I yelled, marching into the cave, thinking the young man would be hiding in the small alcove. I turned a corner and saw a dark tunnel leading deep into the darkest recesses of the granite. This made no sense. As far as I knew, there was no tunnel in this location, especially not one of this size. But it had been well hidden, I mean, nearly invisible in the rock face. I wondered if anyone knew about it. I wondered if it was safe. I didn't feel comfortable going any further. The dark space looked like it went on for a long, long way into the distance, and I was getting an eerie feeling standing there. It felt like I could almost hear voices whispering from all around me. The words were lost in the echoing cave. I got a strong sensation that we weren't alone. 
like icy fingers walking slowly up my spine. The other man came in behind me, marveling in the cave for a second before continuing to press forward. Come on, Greg said, forging ahead. He might be in trouble. He was anxious to keep going. Not scared enough of this horrifying place with whispering voices coming from the shadows, and his apparent lack of fear made me twice as scared. I'm going back for help, I said, shuffling backwards. It isn't safe. Nobody knows we're here. My training and my instincts were overwhelming my curiosity, but Greg seemed not to care about the dangers. The man continued going forward, disappearing into the darkness. A few seconds later, he was gone. There was no indication he had ever existed in the first place. Greg? I called out into the black abyss. There was no response. He might as well have been a ghost. An overwhelming urge to follow him rushed over me, and I took a few steps forward, feeling hypnotized by the black tunnel leading on and on forever. But then I shook my head, slapping my face as I tried to wake myself from whatever trance I was in, which was overruling my common sense. I turned around and I left the cave, my legs shaking and my hands unsteady as I called for assistance. After meeting the search party back at the trail, we went through the woods again to find the cave hiding within the 10,000-foot-tall rock face of Cathedral Peak. But... it was gone. I remember having trouble finding it the first time and thinking it was well hidden amongst the pale gray surface of that mountainside, but... you had to be nearly face to face with the wall to see it, since it was so invisible amongst the crags and the boulders. I tried to tell my supervisor and the other members of the search party, but they didn't believe me. They said there was no tunnel there. They looked for hours. They found nothing. Helicopters swept the area. More teams with more dogs. Bloodhounds. German shepherds. But nothing was turned up. There was no trace of anyone having been out there except me. Dumbfounded for the rest of the week, and for the rest of the summer, I couldn't focus on anything. My mind kept going back to the conversation I'd had with a man on the trail named Greg. The man who'd lost his brother and then disappeared into a cave that didn't exist. More and more, I began to wonder, what would have happened if I'd followed him? It took a full year for me to build up the courage to go back out into the exact spot again. It happened to be on the same date and around the same time of day. Only this time, I wasn't on duty. It was my weekend off, so I had plenty of time to comb the area for clues. My backpack had plenty of provisions, and I had enough to last for a night or two in the woods, maybe longer if necessary. Somehow, I knew, I just had a feeling that if I went back on that day, at that time, it would be there. The cave that didn't exist. Cathedral Peak loomed above me, getting larger as I made my way through the forest, moving towards it. The gray clouds above were shrouding the sun in darkness, while the thickening canopy blocked any remaining light from overhead. A chill ran through me, causing me to shiver involuntarily as I laid eyes on the black hole in the rock face, so plain and clear to see now. Taking a step forward, I found myself standing right in front of it and I reached up my hand to feel the outline of the entryway, as if to confirm it was real. It was. I took a deep breath, like a diver about to submerge, and I went inside. The air was cold and damp with a strange, coppery smell. My flashlight was on my belt, and I grabbed it, but then decided not to turn it on. I was getting a strange feeling. Like I was in an unsafe place and needed to stay silent and hidden. There was a sound coming from up ahead which I couldn't place. It was a slurping, chewing sound like someone tearing meat from bones of their teeth. As I went deeper and deeper into the tunnel, the air became colder and so damp that I felt droplets of water running down my face and into my eyes. A trickle of light was filtering in somewhere as well, causing the cavern to faintly glow in places. The air seemed to shimmer and dance in front of my eyes as I went deeper and deeper, feeling 
entranced as I stumbled along in the shadows. Faintly, I realized that there was something wrong with me. As if I had been drugged, but I no longer cared. In fact, I found the sensation to be quite pleasant. And then I... I was abruptly awoken from my daydream as I came around a corner and saw the horror unfolding within the guts of Cathedral Peak. I, I, I can't begin to explain what I saw down there, and the shadows obscured most of it, drenching the monstrous creature in darkness, but the impression that I got was of something like an, like an octopus or a squid crossbred with an oversized plant or fungus, sucking and slurping, chewing and crunching something beneath its teeth. After a few moments of inspection, I realized it was... It was a person's face that was being eaten as if the details could just barely be seen in the dim light of the cave. The skin was being stripped from its cheek and the eyelids ripped off and the lips peeled back and slurped up through the noodles. Tentacles like tangled vines were everywhere, slithering and sliding across the pale gray stone floors around me. At first I thought it was mud beneath my feet, but as I came fully to my senses I realized it was blood mingling and mixing with the dust beneath my feet, creating a dark toxic red slurry which sucked at my boot heels. The tentacle vine things were everywhere, I realized with numb shock. My feet were actually stepping on some of them. I was amazed the creature hadn't noticed me yet, but it was obviously too caught up with whatever meal it was currently ingesting. Feeling very glad I hadn't turned on my flashlight, I began to back away very slowly. My boots crunching across the writhing tentacles. A sick knot in my stomach was rising up and threatening to make me puke. Fear and revulsion twisting my gut. My mind was spinning and my thoughts were racing, understanding there was a very good chance I would never leave this place. I tried desperately not to step on any more of the squirming, writhing tentacles which moved and twisted on the floor of the cave, soaking and basking in the blood which had spilled everywhere, like pigs rolling happily in the mud. There was no possible way there could be so much of it, I thought. No one person has this much blood. I mean, this, this was a river. And then... I saw the others... They were hanging suspended from the ceiling, from the walls, from everywhere. Amidst the purple vine tentacles, they breathed in and out, still being kept alive, but just barely. Dozens of them were strung up and down the length of the cave, their chests writhing and falling with weak breaths, but none of them opening their eyes or speaking. It was like they were sleeping. After a few long moments of searching, I... I found him. Greg, the hiker from the trail who was looking for his brother, he was, he was hanging upside down from the walls just beside me, his eyes closed. Parts of him were missing. A piece of his cheek, part of his hand. But the wounds were slowly healing. The creature, whatever it was, it kept their victims alive down here, I realized. It was ingesting them slowly, perhaps even using pieces of its other victims as nutrients to feed the ones who were dying of starvation, like an, an otherworldly pyramid scheme built of blood and, and human remains. Shaking the mental image away, I grabbed Greg's shoulder, hoping to wake him up quietly. His eyes shut open a second after I touched him, revealing only the whites, and he began to screech. I, I I don't mean screeching like he was screaming out of fear or of pain or anything like that. It was, it was an inhuman alarm cry, which signified to me immediately there was no shred of humanity left in him. He was now a part of this this hive mind of a creature and its tentacle army. As his head turned on a swivel, I saw smaller tentacles that were wrapped around him, going into his brain, into his neck, invading his ears and his eyes, drilled into his spinal column. I screamed involuntarily, seeing these details and heard the creature in the tunnel as it recognized my presence. It wasn't fast, whatever it was, but it, it was huge. The cave shook around me, dust and pebbles falling from the ceiling above as I backed away from the hiker. Beneath my feet, the vines were suddenly moving quickly, sliding around so that I couldn't find my balance. As soon as my shoes found purchase on the stone floor beneath me, I began to run. 
The tunnel was alive all around me now, the whipping of vines, the twisting and the bending towards me, reaching out like greedy hands, trying to grab me as I raced past. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the amorphous creature's central girth was finding its way through the cave, and it was moving my way a lot faster than I would have thought possible. But then again, I wouldn't have thought any of this was possible before living it. The light of the entryway was just up ahead. I could smell the fresh air. I could see the sun. And then my feet suddenly slipped as if someone had pulled a rug out from under me, and I was crashing to the ground face first. My jaw closed hard, and I bit the end of my tongue, causing it to bleed the taste of copper, filling my mouth a second later. I tried to get to my feet. The mental image of those, those poor trapped people could be seen clearly in my mind's eye. And in, in, in retrospect, I think the creature, whatever it was, needed us to be unsuspecting. If we were aware of what it was doing, this hypnosis that it had, it, it wouldn't work. Maybe it was a chemical that it released which caused people to want to explore the cave, a pheromone like, like insects used to communicate, but it didn't work as well if you knew about it, and if you understood its purpose. It released some more of that pheromone or whatever chemical that it was using to lure people in, and I actually felt my legs grow a bit heavier. My eyelids, too. It was like, like I had suddenly just worked three night shifts, and I, I really needed to sleep. But then the wave of hypnosis passed and I felt the rumbling of the ground beneath me. And that broke me from the trance again, causing me to scramble to my feet from the cave floor and run. As I neared the cave entrance and I sprinted towards it, leaving my backpack far behind in an effort to lighten the load, I saw the rocks were actually closing in, tightening the gap. The entryway was shrinking somehow. It was the vines. It, it was the vines, I realized. They were what was camouflaging the entrance. Their color changed to match the pale gray stone. I, I picked up my pace, the twisting forms beneath me making it even more difficult. I didn't dare risk a glance over my shoulder, feeling the rumbling of the floor, knowing that the bulk of the creature was just behind me, closing in. With the gap of the exit narrowing even further, shrinking to the size of a dartboard, I dove headfirst into it, imagining my face slamming into a sheer rock wall as it suddenly turned to stone right in front of me, sealing me in this dark labyrinth of suffering forever with the rest of these tortured souls. My eyes were squinted tightly shut as I felt the vines pulling and tearing at me as I went violently through the gap. For an instant, they squeezed in around my midsection, threatening to stop me like Winnie the Pooh after an unfortunate attempt at pilfering honey. When I popped out of the hole, and it sealed up behind me in an instant. I heard a loud crash as the creature flew headlong into its own obstruction. The trap it had created to keep me there had hindered its escape, preventing it from chasing after me. I could hear it thrashing and clawing at the vines, desperate for more flesh to sustain itself. However, whatever it was, it was growing too large even for its own control, let alone to feed in the heart of the mountain. It would eventually destroy itself. It would consume its own flesh to sate its monstrous hunger like a snake eating its own tail. I had a very strong suspicion that it was true. And with that very specific idea in mind, I wandered back to my car. It was easier now without the backpack and all the gear, but the walk back to the cave would be harder. There'd be lots to carry next time. After a trip to the hardware store, I went back out to the trail. It was nighttime now, and the place was abandoned. I borrowed one of the Ranger ATVs and took my supplies out to the spot where the cave had been. After bringing a few buckets of water from the lake, I, I began my work. Since I had marked the cave, it was easy to find it again. And I began laying down the fast-drying cement. As park rangers, our job is usually to stop people from vandalizing mountains you know, in this exact way. But I got the feeling Mother Nature would forgive me. It was my job to protect this place and the, and the people within it. Nothing could protect people from this thing. It was best just to seal it away forever. Let it slowly consume itself. Without a fresh supply of hikers, it would eventually run out of calories. It would eventually expire. It was only a matter of time. 
The vine tentacles squirmed beneath a layer of cement, groggily reaching out for me, trying to pull me in. I grabbed the towel and slopped on another thick coating, watched as it rapidly began to dry, and the tentacles began to smooth out and settle down again, falling back to sleep. That inhuman shriek could be heard from inside again much louder this time, as if all the hikers who the creature had abducted had all woken up at the same instant. And for just a second, they realized their predicament. Sorry, Greg, I muttered to myself, alone in the dark forest. I told you not to go in there. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or by listening to tonight's episode of the podcast, or by finding this in some other way that's not a podcast or a video, which I probably didn't upload, but hey, thank you for listening. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Donna Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Ika Limchok, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Cordy Kenshin, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Miver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth Vinoki, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Sec Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jay Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kids, Cryolinian, Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kayo, Psychomo, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you'd like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, or you can honestly support for even just $1, because it really helps me out when you guys do, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon, thank you all so, so much. Thank you for watching on YouTube, and subscribing, and liking videos, and leaving comments about videos that you like, or leaving comments about why I haven't finished the fourth audiobook yet, or leaving comments about... <laughs> New stories that you've seen and you'd like to see on this channel. And to everyone, sweet dreams.